Any questions about anything before we start? Yeah, go ahead. No, I wasn't invited, so. Crash it. Crash it. Oh, so you're going, eh? You're going? I thought this there was I thought they were going to do something like that in Memorial Hall. Is that or Memorial uh, room? Yeah. Yeah, it's in like Memorial. Okay, so th it's not here. It's not th this this also is for trustees. This whole dog and pony show out there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? <clears throat> Any other questions about anything? All right. So we're missing a lot of the front row people today. Huh? Yeah, you're. No, <laughs> I didn't say all of them. No, we got Alex, Ricardo, Manish. All right, so anyway, I'm giving you a kind of a brief intro to Wavelets. And there's actually, by the way, I forget if I mentioned this already, but there's a course here in the math department on, just on Wavelets that Bob Strickhart has been offering for a number of years, like about 10 years. So. You know, if you ever want to take a full math course on this, one is available. And last time what I did was I sort of gave you a sketchy motivation, a little motivational spiel. And then I just said, okay, so we're going to proceed to the definitions, a definition of, of what's going on. And what we're specifically talking about is what I call dyadic wavelets for complex valued L2 signals. And I just want to mention, by the way, and I'll mention this again later on, that this whole theory ratchets up to many dimensions really easily. Like, for example, if you think of a signal as kind of a one-dimensional object, it has a time variable and it varies over time, an image as a two-dimensional object, it varies over two directions. And even spatial objects, like the stuff that Schlumberger is trying to do uh, underground, what they're trying to do is image what's underground, right? And they use wavelets to do this. So this stuff ratchets up to higher dimensions really easily. But I'm just going to talk about it in the context of complex-valued L2 signals, because you've got to start somewhere, OK? So that's what we're going to be discussing. So first, the basic definition. And this we had on the end of the board last time. And oh, and here's some notation that's new. If I'm given x in c to the r and a bigger than 0, scale sub a of x is the signal that has specification scale sub a of x at any time t is x of a t for all t. And what we're going to see when we talk about these wavelets is that we're always going to be talking about shifting and scaling and shifting and scaling and shifting and scaling elementary things. And so we're going to have a lot of shifting and scaling going on. So here's the definition. A, a wavelet, or let's say a dyadic, and I put in parentheses mother wavelet, and there's, there's a lot of, you know, when you read the literature on this, they talk about the mother wavelet, the father wavelet. It's all very sort of traditional heteronormative function theory, you know, that kind of thing. You could do it in a much more kind of, you know, anonymous way if you want to. But I'm going to use the word mother at least. Wavelet is a signal psi 
in L2. And when I say L2, I'm meaning complex valued L2 signals, such that the set of all what I'm going to call psi of nk. And by the way, I want to tell you that if you read different expositions of this, sometimes they use n the way I'm using k and k the way I'm using n. Sometimes they put k before n, whatever. In this class, this is how I'm going to do it. So n and k are both integers. Is a complete orthonormal set in L2, where what are those psi n k's? Psi nk is going to be scale. I always forget the leading constant, so I don't want to forget that now. Silence in the room. Wow. This is, so it's going to be 2 to the k over 2 times the scale sub 2 to the k of shift sub n of psi. And that's for all n and k in the integers. And we often call that set of all psi n k's the wavelet system associated with the mother wavelet psi. So the set of all psi n k's, people say, is the wavelet system associated with the mother wavelet psi. And you can think of it as being all the offspring of this mother, that's why they call it the mother wavelet, all the offspring of the mother wavelet that you get by shifting psi by an integer number, then scaling that result by 2 to the k, and then multiplying it by 2 to the k over 2. OK. So the best way to learn about this is in the context of an example. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the simplest possible example that I can think of. And this was sort of the one that, that people say, well, this is the first time anyone ever thought about wavelets. And then the contrarians, the historical revisionists, say, no, no, no. People thought about wavelets way back in the 19th century, and you're full of whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Flame wars erupt. But I still think this is probably the first one. OK, so, so a basic example. And we're going to look at this one in some detail, because if you understand this one, then you can understand most of the other ones is the Haar wavelet system. And this is due to this guy, Alfred or Alfred Haar, who was a Hungarian mathematician. He came up with this around 1910. And it was actually the subject of his PhD thesis. His PhD was under Hilbert. Hilbert was his advisor. So this was, this was a, you know, a direct hilbert -y kind of thing that was going on. All right, so what is the mother wavelet for the Haar system? So the mother wavelet, psi, has specification psi of t is equal to a positive 1 between 0 and 1 half. And, and I'm putting the, the inequalities the way that everyone does. So you, know, you don't have to do them this way, because we're, we talk mostly about decent stuff. And it, it has value minus 1 when t is between 1 half and 1. So the left interval here is closed. The right one is open. I'll put a graph up in a second, and 0 otherwise. So this is what psi of t looks like versus t. It's a signal that's 0 for time less than 0, and then it starts being 1 at time 0, out to time 1 half, and between time 1 half and 1, it's minus 1, not 0, sorry, it's minus 1, and then at 1 it starts being 0 again. So it's just a little step function that has a plus and minus part to it. 
And that's the mother wavelet of the Haar system. Now, just as a little reality check here, suppose I have a wavelet system based on some mother wavelet psi. What is psi 0, 0 relative to psi itself? Yeah, psi 0, 0 is just psi. Okay? So note that for any such wavelet system, psi 0, 0 is just the mother wavelet, psi. Let's graph a few of the psi nk's for the Haar system. First, I'll graph psi 0, 2 of t versus t, or psi 0, 1 of t versus t. Psi 0, 1 of t versus t is what? Look at the definition of how you get psi nk. It's 2 to the k over 2, so that's going to be 2 to the 1 half, because k is 1 here, times scale sub 2 to the k, of shift sub n, and n is 0 here, so there's no shifting going on. So this is scale 2 of psi at time t. Now when you take psi and you scale it by 2, all that does is it gives you that little step function starting at 0 and ending at 1 half instead of 1, and sort of squashing everything down to half the size, but you ratchet up the height by square root of 2. So this starts off here, it's 0 for time less than 0, Starts off at square root of 2 here, and at time 1 half it goes down to minus square root of 2, and then out to one, at time 1 fourth, I should say, it goes down to minus square root of 2, and then at time 1 half it starts being 0 again. So that's psi 0, 1. It's a compressed and height slightened up. Now, why the square root of 2? Why to the 2, the k over 2? Well, you need that to make this orthonormal so that the norms of this in L2 are all going to be 1. That's what the leading factor is for. So how about psi 1, 1 of t versus t? That turns out to be this thing shifted over to start at 1 half and end at 1. So it's 0 before time 1 half, and then at time 1 half it becomes square root of 2. And then it goes down to minus square root of 2 at time 3 fourths. And then it starts being 0 again at time 1. Okay. So that's psi 0, 1 and psi 1, 1. Now, one thing I want to point out here is that the order that you do the scaling and the shifting in matters. You can construct these wavelets doing things in either order, but you have to be careful at the subscripts on the scale and the shift functions. Okay? So here's an observation. This is true, actually, for any signal x. So for any signal x in C to the R, if I take scale sub 2 to the k of shift sub n of x, and this is what I would do to psi to get psi nk, that's the same as shift sub n times 2 to the k, or 2 to the minus k, scale 2 to the k of x. And I want to make this subscript visible, so it's n times 2 to the k, 2 to the minus k. Now let me prove that for you. It's pretty easy to show. Let's look at the left-hand side at time t. So scale sub 2 to the k of shift sub n of x at any time t. 
What is shift sub n of x at time t? It's x of t minus n. So this is scale sub 2 to the k of x of t minus n. And when I have any function of t, so think of this as a y of t in here, scale to the 2 to the t, y of t, where y of t is x of t minus n. When I scale 2 to the k, that just puts a 2 to the k in front of the t. So it's x of 2 to the k t minus n. Now what can I do? I can factor as follows. This is x of 2 to the k t minus n times 2 to the minus k. And this is what I get by first shifting x by n times 2 to the minus k and then scaling it by 2 to the k. So that's why that identity is true. And it's a nice thing to know. Yeah? Yeah. It should be a half, three quarters, one. This is. <laughs> oh, right here, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's why, that's why I put this up. That's why I made a big meal out of this. Yeah. So, yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's why you have to be careful of this thing, these things, the shifting and scaling. You can't do them in any order. Wait, so if, if there's no scaling, then the shift is just going to be regular shift. Right? Exactly, yeah. But if you, if you shift first by one and then scale, the scaling doesn't affect the one that you've already shifted. Okay, but if you, if you scale first and then you shift that result by one, that will give you the same thing. You have to shift it by one times a half. So that's why that thing is shifted by a half, even though the n is one. You, you have to go through a few of these. You have to like work, oh, let's see, we're, let's graph it versus t, see what's going on, that kind of thing. But, but I'm going to write this over here in a, in a kind of an abstract way because I'm going to refer back to it later. It goes like this, scale sub 2 to the k. Shift sub n is always going to be equal to shift n times 2 to the k scale 2 to the k. And by this abstract statement, I mean that these operators on signals are the same. But it's minus k, right? Yeah, two, I always forget the minus. Sorry about that. n times 2 to the minus k. All right, now, this Haar wavelet system has a really nice pro let, me, let me do a couple more example ones uh, for, for negative values of k. So you can see that, that that's true as well. So this is going to be psi sub, and I'm going to, this is going to have n equals 0 and k equals minus 1 of t versus t. What's this going to be? This is going to be the signal that is constant function 1 out to time 1, then goes down to or not constant function 1, but constant function 1 over square root of 2. Then it goes down to minus 1 over square root of 2 at time 1. And then at time 2, it turns off again. And you can check that out for yourself. And let's do psi 1 comma minus 1 of t versus t. That one is 0 up until time 1, and then it becomes 1 over square root of 2 for a while, out to time 2, and then it goes down to minus 1 over square root of 2, and then out to time 4, or no, uh, no, time 4. Yeah, this is time 3. No, let's see. 
1 to 2, and this starts off at 2, and then goes to 3, and then goes to 4. That's what happens. So psi 1, 1 has all of its activity on the interval 2 to 4, psi 0, or psi 1 minus 1. And psi 0 minus 1 has all of its activity on 0 to 2. Amanda? These are still all 0 before. Yeah, 0 before, always 0 before. OK, now you can go and graph these until you're, yeah, Ian. Yeah, going back to the inequality where it says observation, where you Yeah. It does, but you have to change what you're shifting by. See, the, the thing, the subscript of the shift in this one is n. The subscript of the shift in this one is n times 2 to the minus k. <coughs> uh, I'm a little bit mm -hmm. It's like, it seems by the observation that you want to like, prove some sort of operation where you can switch whether you do scale first or whether you do shift first. Mm -hmm. Oh, that should be, uh, that, that's wrong. That last line should say shift sub thing times scale time thing. Let, let me fix that. You're right. That very last thing I wrote up there. Had it in the wrong order. This is shift time of n times 2 to the minus k of scale. 2 to the k of x of time t. That's what it should say. Got it? All right, thank you for that. OK, anyway, the, the, these are examples of the wavelets that appear in the Haar system. And of course, there's, infinitely uncount there's countably infinitely many of them, and they're doubly indexed. Okay, now all the Haar wavelets have an interesting property, and a lot of wavelet systems share this property. And you may remember last spring in 2200, if you took it last spring, we, we talked about if you have a, a finite duration signal, its support interval is the, in some sense the largest interval over which it's non-zero. Okay, so recall, if you will, that for x in c to the r, the support interval of x is this, essentially. And we couldn't state it this way last spring because we didn't have the notions of infant soup. It's what I call t underbar and t overbar, where t underbar equals the inf of the set of all t such that x of t is non-zero, and t overbar is the soup of all those t's. So it's not technically the support of the signal x. The support of a signal x is actually the set of all t's such that it's non-zero, or the closure thereof. The support interval I'm thinking of as the closed interval between the inf of all the t's for x being non-zero and the sup of all t's. So all the activity in a finite duration signal x. And, and the t and t under bar and t over bar are less than infinity in absolute value when x has finite duration, which is sort of a background assumption here. And we. Notice that all of these Haar wavelets have finite duration. They have bounded support intervals. So all Haar wavelets have finite duration. And in fact, the support interval for 
psi n k is going to be the following. It's going to be n times 2 to the minus k, comma, n times n plus 1 times 2 to the minus k. And you can check it versus those ones up there and make sure you believe that. So each support interval, <laughs> what? I was so scared. <laughs> I was like, n plus. Like, n plus parentheses, parentheses to the k, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, my Blackboard C syntax isn't isn't doing too well today. Okay, so so think of it qualitatively speaking. Each of the psi n k's, as k increases, what that means is that the support intervals get smaller, get narrower. So the support interval of psi n k is smaller, or decreasing, or smallening, whatever the word for that is. What is the word for smallening? Diminishing. That's shrinking. Excellent. That's great. And every time you ratchet k up by 1, k to k plus 1, it results in a factor of 2 shrinkage. What? What's so funny, Alex? Rohit, tell me what, what's funny. Just the grammar. I, I wanted to make sure to have present participles, parallel construction, you know. I'm kind of I'm picky about that, you know? Like, anyway, you probably noticed. All right, so, so anyway, the, the, the sine k is shrinking. And to be precise, k going to k plus 1 implies that the support interval gets halved in length. Okay? So in some sense you're getting this, this exponential decrease in the size of the support intervals of sine k's k increases. And therefore, for this reason, we call the wavelets for large k high resolution wavelets and the wavelets for small k low resolution wavelets. This is the standard slang that people use. So the psi n k when k is large, people call them high res wavelets. And k small, low. Okay, the word resolution comes up an awful lot when you're talking about wavelets. And what's the intuition here? And I'm going to show you, I'm going to wave my hands through a proof that this Haar wavelet system gives you a complete orthonormal set in L2. But first, given that we have that fact, okay, so assuming for the moment, which is true, so a proof to follow or a proof in quotes to follow that the set of all psi n k such that n and k are integers is a complete orthonormal set in L2. What can we do? We can do an orthogonal expansion of any x in L2. And if you want you can just assume x is decent, say. So assuming that's true, we can, we can do an orthogonal expansion (coughs) 
x equals the sum over all k, the sum over all n of x inner product with psi nk times psi nk of any decent, if you want, x in L2. And what is the true meaning of this expression, this infinite sum expression? Let me just remind you about that. So this really means, the infinite sum means that if you take the L2 norm of x minus sum from k equals minus capital K to capital K, sum from n equals minus capital N to capital N of x psi nk times psi nk squared and you take the limit as n and k go to infinity of that, you get 0. So that's what orthogonal expansions mean when you have a doubly indexed set, Alex. And, and, uh, yes? Where do I have a 0? Uh, I meant that's that's a sloppy minus infinity. Okay, <laughs> I can't read. It. Are you talking about? I forget. I always forget. I have this 1960s pointer. Are you talking about this? Yes. That's minus infinity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. So so anyway, that's the the meaning. Now, assuming for the moment that's true, then you have that. Now, these coefficients in this expansion, the x inner product with psi n k. for all k and n. These are the, the Haar wavelet coefficients associated with x. So their x is what they call Haar wavelet coefficients. And if you remember last time I, I talked about how we, we're trying to go beyond Fourier series and Fourier transforms, the Fourier series coefficients are the thing you get when you take a Fourier series of a periodic signal. The Fourier transform is the thing you get when you take the Fourier transform of a signal. And the Haar wavelet coefficients are the thing you get when you do wavelets, Haar wavelets for a signal. So these are going to be kind of like, these are, going to, these are supposed to do the kind of job that the Fourier series coefficients or the Fourier transform do for signals for signal X and L2, but in a better way, in ways that are better in fashions that I mentioned last time. Okay, now what's the intuition here? The intuition of these things is that if, if one of those coefficients is, is relatively large, so here's the intuition, if you have x inner product of psi and k relatively large, What that means, essentially, is that the signal x has significant, whatever that means, activity, so to speak, of resolution. And when I say resolution, it's kind of like frequency, but not quite. around 2 to the k near time n times 2 to the minus k. 
Now that's sort of an eyeful, yeah, Ju Xiong. Sorry, I'm not really getting the point of value for the limit. Oh, I'm just trying to give a meaning to the infinite sum. That's all. So how does the infinite sum like prove anything about Well, let's back up. Let's back up. Remember we talked about Fourier series as orthogonal expansions? We had we had a periodic signal x, we had Sn of x, and I said that that you th that if I say x equals the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of x inner product wk times wk, what that really means is that, something like that. The L2 norm. This is the L2 norm, by the way. So I, I, to be really precise, I could have put a subscript on there. The integral from minus infinity to infinity of this minus this, those are signals, squared, magnitude squared, goes to zero as n and k go to infinity. Yeah, don't, uh, don't get hung up on this. Think of, just think of the infinite sum. Just think of it as, think of this, the psi nk's as being at like an infinite orthonormal basis for L2. Just like the exponentials were an infinite orthonormal basis for L2 t0, right? Okay, well anyway, here, this is a key thing here. That relative, the, the intuition behind the wavelet coefficients is that if for some n and k value, x inner product with psi nk, namely the wavelet coefficient that goes with wavelet psi nk, if it's relatively large, that sort of means that x has significant activity of resolution frequency about 2 to the k near time, n times 2 to the minus k. Okay, that's kind of what it means. And so what we're doing, see, the, because psi nk for, is localized, very localized, what we're doing in this coefficient x inner product of psi and k is getting very local information about x. Local meaning near time n times 2 to the minus k. So the idea here is that the, the local, localized nature of psi and k, namely that its support interval is of that form, means that x psi and k gives info, it gives highly local, and the road to hell is paved with adverbs, so I'm going to erase highly. It gives local info about x's behavior near time 2 to the minus k. And that local info is in the nature of what level of activity, what sort of kind of frequency look does it have around that time k. Now what's cool about this versus Fourier is, I'll get, I'll get to your question in one second, is that to figure out a Fourier coefficient for a periodic signal or the Fourier transform at a single frequency omega, you need the whole signal, you need to look at the whole signal. But to figure out the wavelet coefficient for some pair n and k, you only need to know what the signal is doing around those times. You don't need, it doesn't matter what it's doing later, it doesn't matter what it's doing earlier. Okay, so it depends, unlike Fourier, where to get, say, x hat of omega for any single omega value, requires or required all of x of t for all t. Okay, question. What's that? You kind of just answered it. I was going to ask, uh, for periodic signal in particular, is the confirmation of the addition? Because Yeah, well, remember, periodic signals are not L2 signals. So this is not something you do for periodic signals. You could do it for one period of a periodic signal, yeah. But, but we're talking here, this is for signals, periodic signals don't go to zero as t goes to infinity, so they sort of can't be L2. That's, but you're right, you're, you're, you're to notice that. Okay, now remember last time I said, wouldn't it be nice if we had some kind of a, a transformish kind of thing to do that was more local in nature than Fourier? 
This is an example of how this is more local than Fourier. OK, now what do people do once they find the cyan case? They make these plots. And these plots are kind of like spectrograms in a certain sense. And you might even have a, there might even be a MATLAB function to, there must be, you know, to do this. I, I haven't, <laughs> I learned just enough MATLAB to do 2200 last spring, so. <laughs> um, yeah, Zach. Well, wait, you'll have to wait on that. Because it turns out there's, when I talk about the fast wavelet transform, which I'm, I was hoping to get to today, I'm not sure it's going to happen. It turns out it looks an awful lot like what you do with an FFT. It's the same kind of savings. You know, you choose a finest resolution you want to go for, and then you work backwards, and you can compute the coefficients from the previously computed ones. You don't ever have to go through computing all these inner products. So please bear with me on that. OK, so what do people do, assuming they found a bunch of the y? And by the way, if you only care about the signal over, say, some bounded range of times or some bounded range of resolutions, you only have to find finitely many of these things. So note, if you care about x only over some, some finite range of times, or a bounded range of times, and or over some bounded range of resolutions, then you can focus your your computation of this, the x inner product with sine k, the wavelet coefficients, accordingly. So in particular, if, if you're dealing with a finite duration signal x, you're only going to have to look at, for any given k, a finite number of n values. And if your range of k's is also bounded, you're only going to have to look at a completely finite range of k and n values. So if you have a signal that's, that's really cool, except for at that awkward moment when it does something or whatever, you can do a wavelet analysis of what it's doing around that awkward moment and understand what's going on there without going through an entire wavelet analysis of the whole signal. All right, so that's just some fluffy intuition about this. The, the missing detail here is the thing I said, assuming for the moment, that the psi and k's actually form an orthonormal basis for L2, or an orthonormal, complete orthonormal set. And now is actually a good time to take the three minute break, and then I'll give a hand wavy proof of that. You can, probably, you can probably see for yourself if you think about it carefully enough. But anyway, disjoint support intervals. So say you fix k. So say k is fixed, and you look at psi n k as you run n over the integers. So say k is fixed, then all the psi n k's for n in the integers have disjoint support intervals which means that they're all mutually orthogonal. Because if you take them and multiply them together and integrate 
from minus infinity to infinity, you get 0. And if you look over the k values changing, so as for, say, psi n k and psi, say, m comma k prime being orthogonal for any n and m, if you think about it, you'll see that when k is less than k prime, psi n k is constant. It's either equal to plus or minus 1 or 0 over the support interval. of psi m k prime, which means that when you take the product of psi n k and the product of psi m k prime and integrate them, you get the integral of something that's going plus and minus whatever over times a constant, and that integrates to 0. So thus, the integral of minus infinity to infinity of psi n k of t psi m k prime of t dt equals 0, which means that those guys are also mutually orthogonal. And it doesn't matter whether n and m are the same or different. And if you, I'm just going to write that down in words, and you can look at it yourself. You can look at the examples we put up on the board earlier. Now, why are they a complete orthonormal set? Now we know they're orthonormal. So thus, the set of all psi and k is orthonormal. <laughs> Y complete they're complete because it turns out that if you take an X that's perpendicular to all of them okay so if you can show you can show that if X inner product with psi and K is equal to 0 for all n and K in Z, then X is constant. And I'm going to give you a hand wavy argument for that in a second. If you know that X is in L2 and X is constant, what do you know X is? Zero. So thus X equals zero because, by assumption, x is in L2. OK, so why is, it, why is it true that if x is perpendicular to all these guys, then x is constant? Here's the hand wavy argument. Here, the, proof, the, the proof of this statement goes like this. Let's, look, let's concentrate on the interval 0 to 1. t goes from 0 to 1. So let's focus on t in the interval 0 to 1. OK? If you, If you look at the inner product of x with the mother wavelet for the Haar system, x psi, which is the same as x psi 0, 0, if that's 0, what does that mean? That implies that the integral of x from 0 to 1 half equals the integral from x of x from 1 half to 1.
And from that, you can infer that the average value of x over the interval 0 to 1 half equals the average value of x over the interval 1 half to 1. So the average of x on the interval 0, 1 half equals the average of x on the interval 1 half to 1. Now we take the inner product of x with wavelets that are one resolution higher. So x <laughs> psi 0, 1 equals 0. Psi 0, 1 is focused on the interval 0 to 1 half. And this says that the average of x on the interval 0 to 1 fourth equals the average of x on the interval 1 fourth to 1 half. And that has to equal the average of x on 0 to 1 half. If you have the average of the x on the interval 0 to 1 fourth the same as the average of x on the, on the interval 1 fourth to 1 half, then the average of x on both of those intervals has to equal the average of x on the reunion of the intervals. And if I take x inner product psi 1, 1, And by the way, if you look at a, a most like Wikipedia level articles on this, they'll say it's easy to show that the, the Haar wavelet system is an orthonormal, is a complete orthonormal set. You, you actually have to go through this. So if you take x psi 1, 1 equals 0, that implies that the average of x on the interval 1 half to 3 fourths is the same as the average of x on 3 fourths to 1, which must therefore be the same as the average of x on 1 half to 1. And we know that the averages of x on 0 to 1 half and 1 half to 1 are the same, so all these averages are the same. So all the averages are the same. So far. And if you continue with lower resolution wavelet or higher resolution wavelets, so x psi and k equals zero for larger k, you discover that the average of x on every interval of the form. L times 2 to the k to L plus 1 times 2 to the k for all k's, and I'm, I'm assuming this is contained in the interval 0, 1, for all k bigger than 0, 2 to the minus k, this has to be, by the way, are the same. And therefore, x has to be constant. If, if certainly, if it's decent, it has to be constant. So at least if x is decent. And it turns out in, in a Lebesgue measure style, x has to be constant on 0 to 1. <coughs> OK, so what we've shown here, or what I've given you, a hand, like I told you, is only going to be a hand wavy proof. I've shown you in a hand wavy fashion that if x is perpendicular to all the wavelets whose support intervals are contained in the interval 0 to 1, then x has to be constant on the interval 0 to 1. And then all you have to do is generalize that out. And look at longer intervals. So in short, from that,
x is constant on 0 to 1 if x psi n k is equal to 0 for all psi n k whose support intervals is contained in 0 to 1. <laughs> whose support intervals are contained in 0 to 1. And then you sort of ratchet this out to like intervals of 0 to 2 and minus 2 to 0 and 4 to 6 and all that kind of thing. <laughs> so you look at at longer intervals, longer dyadic intervals. For example, 0 to 2, 2 to 4, etc. And you keep discovering that x has to be constant on all such intervals. And all their averages over all those intervals have to be equal. So x has to be constant on any interval of the form, say, minus 2 to the L up to 2 to the M for all L and M bigger than 0. And from that it follows that x has to be constant, because there's no way that once you get L and M big enough, you're going to be above the L2 norm of x. So x has to be constant to be in L2. OK, so that uh, maybe I shouldn't have gone through that whole argument, or maybe I should have just given you a handout. But I, I just wanted to show you, just for this particular really easy example of wavelets, making sure that it's a, a complete orthonormal set, you do have to do a little bit of work. All right, so this is the Haar system. Now, what, what do people do once they have the wavelet coefficients for signal x over some range, say, of n and k values? They make these pictures. And just imagine that the coefficients come out to be real. So you're just finding real numbers. You, you may not. You may find complex numbers and you can plot the magnitudes. So, say you have x, psi, and k over a whole range of n and k values. Imagine making a two-dimensional plot And you, you know, you, maybe you've done this before. You don't even have to imagine it. But, but just imagine creating a 2D grayscale, say, plot of magnitude of x psi and k graphed at position n times 2 to the minus k comma k in your plot. What you're going to end up with is your horizontal axis is going to be like time and your vertical axis is going to be like scale slash resolution. So the horizontal axis is like time. The vertical axis is like resolution or scale. And depending on where the dark spots are, and I'm thinking of this grayscale plot as being darker when this thing has a bigger magnitude and lighter when the thing has a smaller magnitude. Depending on where the plot is darker, those are time points where x has activity at the resolution 
in the resolution axis. Okay, so so thus we can we can sort of eyeball this picture. We can look at this picture and say, oh, you know, because the wavelet coefficients are this way, x has a lot of activity up at this scale over this particular time. So if you have a dark spot, so if there's a dark spot at point say n0 times 2 to the minus k0 comma k0 you can say quote x has activity of resolution or scale k slash frequency 2 to the k around time n0 times 2 to the minus k0, 2 to the k0 here. So we see from such a, what people call a time frequency plot some qualitative information about x. And, and harking back to last time, the things we were trying, the problems we were trying to solve with other means of orthogonal expansion, one of the problems was when did the finite duration A440 happen? Okay, so from such a picture, you get an answer to that question. So from such a picture, which people call a time frequency plot, and it, it is sort of, it is related to the spectrogram. In a kind of a discrete way, you can see the answer to that question we asked last time. When did the finite duration A440 happen? You'll have this plot and you'll say, ooh, there's this black spot over this range of times at this height. This range of times is when the finite duration A440 occurred, or, or, or something, let, we'll say something happened over this range of times. What happened? We look over on this axis and we see the scale of what was happening. And it's going to be on the range, it's going to be a power of 2 near 440 hertz. Anyway, well, that, that's, that's another question that we answered with the, this wavelet stuff. We can answer it with this wavelet stuff. All right, now it turns out the Haar system is a special case of a really powerful mathematical construction that leads to a lot of different interesting wavelet systems. And so I want to go over that real quick. Well, maybe not real quick. So the Haar system is an example of a special kind, but fairly general kind of wavelet system. that arises from something called multi-resolution analysis of L2, or MRA. And this is something that this French guy, Yves Malat, pioneered in the 80s. So a wavelet system that arises from what's called a multi resolution or multi-resolution analysis. Okay? And not every wavelet system is of this is of this type. But the ones that are easy to work with are
So all the quote unquote easy to use ones do. All the ones that anybody pays any attention to. All the ones for which the so-called fast wavelet transform works arise from what's called a multi-resolution analysis. So how does this go? How does this go? All right. So what I want to do is I want to define, and this is the thing that some people call the father wavelet for the Haar wavelet system, but I'm not going to call it that. I'm just going to call it the scaling function associated with a Haar wavelet system. So define the scaling function associated with the Haar system. as the signal phi, so it's not psi, it's phi, with specification phi of t is equal to 1 when t is bigger than or equal to 0 and less than 1 and 0 otherwise. So phi is just this, this flat thing, this boring flat thing that's 0 before time 0, then it jumps up to 1, and then it's 0 after 1. OK. I wanted to find some subspaces, and I guess we're, we're up to almost to the end. So what's going to happen is, if I have a step function, a, sig a signal that's a step function that's constant on all the integer intervals, 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and so on. So it's just a step function. That means I can express it as an infinite linear combo of this shifted. And we're going to call that subspace of L2 V0. It's going to be the set of all things with zero resolution. Then I'm going to look at the things with, that are constant over half length intervals. And we're going to call that V1, and so on. And it turns out we're going to have a nested sequence of subspaces of ever higher resolution converging on L2. And we can think of the wavelets as getting from one level to the next of this, this multi-resolution analysis. And it turns out that the, all the computational advantages that I promise you guys, especially Zach, <laughs> come from wavelet systems that have multi-resolution analyses. And this one does, does. So we'll get to that next time. And then hopefully you'll be done with this. One way to get really sweaty is to give a lecture on something you've never talked about before. Because it makes you nervous. <laughs> <laughs>